Greetings, students. Welcome to COM 201, Intro to Digital Photography, uh, as well as COM 285, Photojournalism. Uh, this first lecture will cover uh, the basics of camera use uh, before you learn any other aspects of either um, the introduction of photo or photography, rather, or photojournalism. Uh, you need to know your cameras well. Um, you, know how to do, you do know how to use them manually, um, inside and out. Um, although automatic settings are good initially, you want to have more control over your devices. And so um, I start both of these lectures with a comprehensive look at the camera, um, no matter which model you have. Um, just a preview of what we'll be going over. Uh, we'll again be looking at camera types, uh, different types of cameras that you can use uh, for any of these endeavors. And we'll also go into how to control them manually, taking it off the automatic setting and trying to get the most out of your camera. So let's start with looking at camera types. Um, uh, there are three main types of cameras that we'll be looking at here. Um, your point and shoot camera, uh, a smartphone camera, which many of you should be familiar with at this time. Um, everyone that has a smartphone or has used a smartphone has probably shot a photo on their, that uh, smartphone. So you're probably very familiar with uh, cameras on smartphones. We will also discuss DSLRs or digital single lens reflect cameras. Let's start with the point and shoot lens or the point and shoot camera with a fixed lens. Um, well, let's first talk about some of the um, pros and cons of these cameras. Um, one thing that you want to familiarize yourself with, no matter which camera you're using, are the limitations of those cameras. And so uh, let's talk about some of the cons uh, with these cameras. Um, with a point and shoot camera, uh, unlike the cameras that we'll be seeing uh, later on in the lecture, um, you can't change the focal length for the most part, um, or at least you are limited to the focal length that's on the fixed lens on the on the body of the camera. Um, so you don't have uh, a lot of uh, versatility in terms of the focal length. You're kind of trapped within um, a certain measurement of focal length. Uh, now, that's one small disadvantage. Um, but there are many advantages to having this type of camera. Um, for one, there are, and you can see from the picture here, they're small, they're compact. Um, there was uh, what we call walk around cameras. And so uh, you don't have to worry about lugging this huge chunk of equipment around. It's very um, uh, easy to carry around and concealable. You also have, <clears throat> excuse me, most of these cameras can produce uh, similar uh, quality images that a DSLR, a more professional camera can, and so uh, you don't uh, you don't have a lack of quality there. Um, just because you've decided to shoot with a point and shoot lens, you still can get uh, pristine quality images from a point and shoot camera as well. Also, they have just about as uh, many manual settings as the more professional DSLR cameras do as well. So um, just because you're using a point and, sh uh, point and shoot fixed lens camera doesn't mean that you don't have a lot of options there. Um, you're not uh, that limited when you're using this camera. However, of course, if you have a DSLR or professional grade camera, um, there's a lot of a lot more versatility with those cameras. Um, there's a lot more um, bells and whistles, uh, so to speak, um, that you have with those cameras versus this camera. Uh, however, again, still a, you know, a solid camera. Uh, really, it's going to, and you'll find this with many uh, cameras, no matter which one you use, is that it's not just about the hardware. It's about the person that's using them, um, how that person has trained their eye to see um, composition, lighting, so on and so forth, things that we'll talk about in the course later on. Um, so again, solid camera, um, nothing to be ashamed about if you have one of these cameras. Next, we'll talk about 
smartphone cameras uh, or cameras on smartphones rather. And again, uh, as I spoke about earlier in the lecture, um, these are probably uh, some of your more uh, well-known cameras, especially this day and age where um, most of the population has a smartphone. Um, and, and of course, if you have a smartphone, um, typically there are cameras embedded in the smartphone. So um, most of you have probably grown up or uh, been accustomed to shooting photos on your phone. Uh, that being said, you may have not thought about uh, composition, and lighting, and all the important aspects of photography when using these phones uh, or the cameras on the phone rather. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And again, we'll talk about um, pros and cons of having uh, this device or using this, this device for photography. Um, let's start with a few advantages. One thing is that you're able to um, shoot, edit, and share your images all within one device. Um, everything is there. Um, you don't have to worry about if you have a DSLR point and shoot, pulling out your memory card, your SD card, inserting it into a computer, downloading the images, editing the images on another computer. Um, everything is in-house, so to speak. And so um, they're very uh, efficient machines in that way. Um, again, you've probably heard this statement before that uh, we have tiny computers in our pockets whenever we're using these things. And, uh, certainly that is true, but not just small computers, but again, uh, cameras, processors, editing software, everything that you need is within that device. And so um, it's quite handy in that way. Now, some other advantages is that um, it keeps the photo caption process somewhat simple. Um, you don't have to worry about um, uh, all of these settings that you have with uh, manual cameras. Now, that being said, uh, like I said earlier, we're going to try to, within this course, um, have you use software that has more manual capability or manual editing capability. And so um, we're going to talk about all that stuff. But um, if you want to keep it simple, you can. Um, there's times where I'm walking around campus or um, just uh, out and about and I'll see a composition that I want to capture. If I have my DSLR, I have to pull it out, make sure that the settings are right, adjust all these things, and then shoot. Whereas uh, if I'm using my phone, I slide it out, jump, uh, jump right into my camera app, and frame up my shot and start to shoot. It, it's it's a, a bit more efficient in that way. Now, some of the disadvantages. Um, you are limited in terms of your focal length. Again, if you notice, even on the, the photo here, um, <clears throat> when you see all these iPhones arranged um, side by side here, the cameras, albeit powerful cameras that can um, that have um, uh, they can capture great images with high resolution, um, and in a lot of cases, uh, you can capture images in low light, which is important. Um, the quality of, the, of these cameras have uh, has uh, skyrocketed over the past years. Um, that being said, you're still limited to the focal length of the camera. You can only capture usually uh, uh, what's directly in front of you. That being said, um, obviously you can capture landscapes, more wider shots too. But if you're shooting a specific subject, or you're shooting a person or an object, you usually can't get too far away from that person without losing... Um, context of what you're shooting if you're trying to focus on that one person or, or object or thing, whatever that thing may be. And so it forces you to have to move around and get the shot, as it were. And again, that's, you know, that, that can be seen as a disadvantage, but also some people see it as an advantage in terms of um, pushing you to um, go and get the shot rather than uh, standing in one place and using a telephoto lens and uh, capturing the shot that way, zooming in on your subject from afar. Um, it forces you to move your feet, to be creative, and to find the shot. And of course, um, you can't exchange lenses um, like you would a DSLR, although there are some options out there for um, lens connectors. If you can, uh, I believe I've seen somewhere, uh, the lens, so you'll have a telephoto lens or a wide angle lens that could be attached to the phone's case. Um, there's plenty of accessories out there that you can find, uh, but again, that's extra money, that's extra um, 
you know, purchases that you have to, uh, that you have to make just to make this thing uh, more of a DSLR experience. So some advantages, some cons there. Um, I think the biggest pro is that again, you have a device that has everything within it, the camera, the editing software, and then the ability to share that image or images with the public at mass within seconds. Piggybacking off of um, uh, the smartphone discussion here, um, for the longest time, it was uh, discussed that, well, uh, smartphones are, are small, current cameras on smartphones rather, uh, are not as advanced as DSLRs uh, in terms of image quality, um, even not as advanced as point and shoot cameras. Um, the megapixels weren't as high as needed um, to have really nice quality, sharp images. Um, that was the early argument with uh, uh, smartphone cameras. However, they've come a, quite a long way and you don't have to have a DSLR to shoot quality, sharp images. And there's a lot of examples of that online. Um, one of the photographers that I follow uh, who exclusively uses his iPhone for his photography is Kevin Russ. Um, I always try to push uh, my students to follow um, uh, photographers that they admire, um, photographer, photographers that, um, that you can shoot for, no pun intended in terms of uh, 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 emulating their work. And Kevin Russ is definitely one of those people for me. Uh, he's shown me how dynamic images can be even on the iPhone. Um, um, I would highly recommend you follow him on Instagram if you haven't already. Um, again, his uh, tag is Kevin Russ. You can see it on the screen there. Um, and he, again, primarily shoots uh, exclusively shoots on the iPhone. Um, he is a traveler. He goes around the world. He's definitely been in uh, many places in the United States looking for um, breathtaking landscapes to shoot. He reminds me of kind of a modern day at, um, Ansel Adams in that way. Um, but the point being here is that uh, you don't have to have a DSLR uh, or a point and shoot to capture great film. It's all about um, one finding decent light, knowing how to adjust for the available light that's there, um, and knowing how to compose your shot well. One way that you can become better over time as a photographer is to give yourself uh, different projects. Um, not only, obviously, will I give you projects in this class, uh, but you should be, again, creating your own projects shooting on a daily basis and not just once a day, but multiple times throughout the day, you should be constantly looking for composition and chasing light, interesting types of light, uh, different temperatures of light, different intensities of light. Uh, we will be talking about light and composition uh, later in this uh, series. Uh, in fact, throughout the whole uh, quarter, we'll be talking about that because it's the pinnacle um, aspects of photography. Um, but to my point, you want to shoot daily. And so um, the iPhone is a great tool for that. Again, it's the ultimate walk around tool where you don't have to lug around this huge piece of equipment. You can quite literally put it in your pocket uh, and pull it out whenever. And so uh, over the years, I've given myself, and this is nothing new, uh, other photographers have done this, and I, I stole this basically from, from other photographers, but um, I, I try to shoot a shot daily and post it to an Instagram account. Um, if you'd like to follow my Instagram account, it's uh, in the bottom right-hand corner there, La Daily Snap um, is one of my Instagram handles. And um, within that account, I've tried to, on a daily, um, shoot a shot, edit it, and post it. Um, and these are some of, you know, some of the shots for my portfolio. And I, um, I, uh, I push you to try to do something similar to this because, again, like anything in life, the more you do it, the better you'll be. Uh, the more you follow other interesting photographers and try to emulate their work, um, the better you'll be for it at the end of the day. In fact. Later in this course, uh, one of the assignments is to 
uh, for the entirety of the uh, quarter to shoot a photo and post per day. So um, if you're looking for that down the pipe here, we, uh, that, that assignment should be coming up pretty soon. I think it's the third assignment um, in the series. Again, I can't implore you enough to, uh, to shoot on the daily because uh, it, it will help you in the long run. Now, we talked quite a bit about uh, disadvantages and advantages to using a smartphone uh, or the camera on a smartphone. Now, let's talk about the uh, ultimate toy here uh, in terms of photography, uh, at least in my opinion, the digital single lens reflect or the DSL DSLR um, for short. Um, if you've had any professional photography done of you, or have had any friends that are into uh, photography, professional photography, you've probably seen one of these devices. Um, um, there are many different types, different brands, um, Canon, Nikon, Minolta, uh, Pentax, so tons of brands out there. The top two major brands, at least in the States, um, maybe worldwide, uh, are Nikon and Canon. Um, I've shot Canon primarily. Um, I'm currently shooting with a Sony um, A7R III. Um, Sony has um, put his, its skin in the game in terms of photography. Uh, it's, it's, you know, obviously Sony has been around for, for decades and has uh, created other devices, um, some that I'm sure that you've used in the past. Um, and they're, they're, they're just getting into the photo game here. But I digress. Um, you don't have to have one of these for this class. Um, it does help if you do have one, um, just because you have more to play with here, more to work with. Um, uh, but again, you don't have to have one of these for the class. Let's go over some of the advantages and disadvantages of having uh, a DSLR. For one, obviously, um, this is the tool of professionals. Um, of course, there are hobbyists that you know that use these types of devices. You don't have to be a professional to own one of these. Um, so uh, don't be intimidated if you have been gifted one or if you've uh, had the fortune to purchase one, but haven't used it to its full advantage. Don't be um, discouraged and don't be um, uh, alarmed at all of the uh, bells and whistles that it has. Um, you will eventually become used to using it just as I, uh, over the years, have become used to using mine. Um, but it takes time. It takes practice. It takes uh, using it on a daily basis. But, but don't be intimidated. Just um, uh, just take your time with it. Um, there are tons of tutorials online on how to use them. Um, obviously, I will try to uh, be a resource as well uh, in this course. But don't use me as the only resource uh, that you have. Um, now, again, advantages. Uh, you have, as I discussed earlier, the ability to purchase lenses at different focal lengths. Um, you can have a what's called a prime lens, which is set at one focal length. Um, usually those are perfect for portraiture um, and uh, just shooting one specific type of shot. Um, you also have telephoto lenses that can zoom or zoom telephoto lenses that can zoom from a, um, from a very tight um, shallow depth of field all the way to a longer, um, uh, more in-depth depth of field um, where more things are in, the, in, in focus. So you have a lot of versatility in terms of the, uh, the lenses that you can use and the, uh, the photos that you can capture and the depth of field that you can capture within the shot. Um, so you have the ultimate versatility there. Um, you also have many more uh, onboard features in the camera in terms of adjusting the light that's coming into the lens. Um, you can adjust the uh, ISO, and we'll talk about this later, um, the aperture. Uh, there are tons of different things that you can adjust on the camera itself. Um, you can mount uh, different types of flashes for artificial light, um, so you don't have to always um, uh, you don't you don't always have to use the available light that's there in the room um, or natural light, uh, which are all perfectly fine. And, and when we when we learn more about lighting, you'll see that 
you can use all these different types of light to your advantage. Um, but in tight situations where you don't have a lot of natural light um, or the available artificial light isn't efficient uh, or appropriate rather, uh, you can mount a flash onto this uh, camera and uh, control the amount of light that you're, um, that you're using. Now, one of the major disadvantages, and this may have um, come to you before I've said it, uh, but they can be quite expensive. Um, um, between the body of the camera uh, and the lens of the camera, you can spend upwards to thousands of dollars for this equipment. Uh, that being said, of course, the internet being what it is, um, you can go to eBay, you can go to Amazon when they have sales. You can um, get an entry level DSLR for $300, $400. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not impossible to get one of these cameras. But once you start to um, uh, go into the higher end levels of these devices, uh, again, they can get quite expensive. Um, so uh, unless you are serious about photography or see yourself uh, using this later on, using these devices later on for professional means, or even if you're just a hobbyist and you just want to have uh, top-end equipment, um, you know, just consider making the investment in the DSLR world. Um, don't be intimidated. Don't don't be taken aback just because they're that expensive. Um, it goes back to the old adage, you get what you pay for. And uh, if you want premium top level photography every time, um, or at least um, if you want the ability to be able to create that type of photography and not be limited by uh, uh, many things, this is probably your best bet. Another disadvantage of only one of these cameras is that they can get quite heavy, um, very unlike the point and shoots and the smartphones that we previously looked at. Um, they can get quite heavy. And so if you're not uh, used to using one of these things, um, it might be a little cumbersome to use over a long period of time, especially if you're shooting for an hour or so. Um, some people like myself like to have that heft in their hands whenever they're shooting. Um, I like the way that the DSLR feels, the weight of the camera. But of course, um, over time, it can get cumbersome to, to, to carry around, um, not just shooting, but just having uh, it flung around your neck. If you're moving around, if you're traveling, it's, it, it can be kind of cumbersome. Uh, and again, to some, that might be a small gripe, but it's something to consider. Now, we've talked extensively about three different types of cameras that you can use uh, within this course or in, in general in the world of photography. Um, let's start talking about manual controls, um, how to use these cameras uh, in a manual setting versus, versus the default automatic setting. When starting to talk about using your camera in manual settings, you have to start with uh, what's called the uh, exposure triangle. Um, these are the main uh, attributes that you can change to expose a photo. Um, the first being aperture, the second shutter speed, and the third ISO. And we'll talk about these extensively. Let's start with aperture. So aperture is measured in F numbers. You'll see this commonly uh, on the camera itself, on the lens, um, because some lenses can only achieve certain uh, f-stops. They're called f-stops as well. Uh, and so they'll have it listed on the edge of the lens. Um, you also can see this inside the, uh, uh, the device itself, uh, either by looking through the viewfinder or sometimes, it, depending on what model you have, uh, you'll see it on a little window on the side of uh, the viewfinder. Um, if you're using a smartphone that has software that allows you to change um, those f-stops, you'll see it there as well. Usually it's uh, in the form of a slider um, that you can use to adjust from, uh, from one f-stop to the next. But what you get with this is, uh, in simple terms, the bigger the opening, the smaller the f-number or f-stop. And so you can see in this diagram here, 
at um, f 1.4, um, this circle represents the lens, and you can see that it is wide open at 1.4, meaning that that uh, at that f stop, um, that is the maximum amount or maximum opening allowed to let light into the lens. So when it's wide open like that, you're going to get um, a lot of light pouring into the lens. <clears throat> now, when you get to the larger f stops, the larger f numbers, um, that means that your uh, the opening of the lens will be smaller, so less light will come into the lens. It's kind of an opposite thing here. So the smaller the number, the larger the opening, the more light uh, comes into the lens. Um, and the opposite of that is true if you're going to a larger number, the larger the number or F number, the less light will come into the lens. And you can see an example of that here. Again, as you increase that F number, the opening is smaller, less light comes in and you have less light to expose your image. The larger the number, sorry, excuse me, the smaller the number, the larger the opening and the more light pours into the lens. So you make this adjustment just depending on the available light. If you're shooting in a low light setting, then you're gonna need um, as much light uh, as possible to expose the image. And so you might have to adjust your f-stop to 1.4 or a lower number. Um, if you're shooting in bright light or there's a lot of available light, whether that's natural or artificial, um, you might want to lower your f-number just so that you don't overexpose your image because there's enough available light there and so you don't need a large opening in your lens. One other aspect of aperture is that when the small, when you have a small f-stop, uh, you have a shallower depth of field. And so what that means is um, only a few things in the, in the shot will be in focus, um, primarily uh, whatever the frontmost object is. And so whenever you're shooting, for instance, uh, portraiture, um, Usually, most portrait photographers will use um, a lower f-stop just so that you can get a nice blur uh, between the foreground element, which should be your model, or in this case, uh, bottles of soda, um, and the background is blurred, and so that places more emphasis on the subject, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the frontmost subject in the frame. When your uh, f-stop number is higher, you have more things in focus in the frame. And you can see that example here. As we move up in f-numbers, more things are in focus. I'll go backwards here from f-22. all the way back to 1.4. Now remember what I talked about earlier, whenever you have a lower F number, the opening is larger, so more light is pouring in. And in this case, um, you get a shallower depth of field. And so what should happen if we're at 1.4, Sometimes you might overexpose the image um, at 1.4. And so what you have to do is adjust other things, other elements within that exposure triangle um, that we briefly talked about earlier to expose the image correctly. And so there's this weird um, math going on with, uh, I say weird, but it's somewhat of a simple math, but it, it, it's hard to balance sometimes when you're first starting out. Um, you have to make sure that you have enough available light to expose the image, but you also, in this case, need to make sure that if your purposes are to uh, uh, the element in the frame that is closer to the, the lens, if you want it, uh, your shot to be focused on that, then uh, you need to make sure that you're shooting at a lower aperture. So there's this balance going on between 
needing or making enough um, adjusting your camera so that enough light comes into the lens to expose it properly, but also um, making sure that you are getting the right depth of field. So there's, a, again, a balance with that. Same thing, once you go up the f-stop numbers, at f-22, that image should be pretty dark um, because, again, remember, the larger the number, the smaller the opening in the lens. And so not much light is coming through that lens. Um, so again, you have to adjust other things within that exposure triangle to, to get it right. Um, and so in this case, you're probably adjusting your ISO. And we'll talk about that later on. Um, but you're adjusting other things so that you can compensate for the, um, the smaller opening. Because again, your, your goal might be that you want, as you can see in the example here, most of the image to be in focus, the background, the foreground elements. You want it all to be in focus, um, but you also want to make sure that you don't overexpose the image. And so uh, you're balancing the f-stops, you're balancing um, uh, shutter speed, um, and aperture, exposure, all those things to make the image. Another aspect of photography uh, or, or the exposure triangle is shutter speed. And so shutter speed is the amount of light, uh, sorry, the amount of time allowed by the camera for light to hit its sensor. So um, in every digital camera, um, there is a sensor inside of the lens. And so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Whenever light comes into the lens, when you hit the shutter button, light comes into the lens, it hits the sensor, and that, in effect, um, without going into too, too much technical jargon, um, exposes the image and makes the image. Um, now, just like the aperture controls how much light comes into the lens, the shutter also controls how much light comes into um, the lens and hits the sensor. And so if you have a slower shutter speed, um, not as much light comes into the lens because, sorry, quite the opposite, more light is allowed to come into the lens because the shutter is staying open longer. One effect of the shutter uh, staying open longer is not only more light, but it's harder to capture motion. And so if you have a slower shutter speed, um, typically if someone runs in front of the camera, you'll get this blur that, that, uh, that you'll capture for the, uh, in front of the, uh, the lens because the camera isn't moving fast enough to, or the, rather the shutter isn't moving fast enough to stop that person in their place, so to speak. And so um, the slower the shutter speed, the more light comes into the lens and you're not effective in capturing motion with that speed. Now, if you have a fast shutter speed, there's uh, not enough light that comes in or not a lot of light comes into the lens. And so you're, you, that, again, that's controlling the amount of light that comes into the lens um, and hits the sensor. And so the images will be a little darker, but also the trade-off to that is uh, with a faster shutter speed, you can stop motion in its tracks. And so if you're shooting a sporting event, if you're shooting something that has a lot of motion in it, um, it's better to shoot at a faster shutter speed. But again, just like all the other aspects of the exposure triangle, if you are going at a faster shutter speed, not enough light is going to come into the lens, hit the sensor. And so you have to adjust other elements um, to make sure that you have enough light to expose the image properly. And so again, that might be that you shoot at a lower aperture. Um, it might mean that you shoot at a higher ISO um, to get more light, uh, make the sensor more light sensitive. And we'll talk about that in a second here. But there's always a trade-off. There's always an adjustment that you have to make whenever you're shooting manually um, in order to get the desired effect.
Here, I wanted to show you what the shutter looks like whenever it is opening and closing. No matter if you're shooting at a fast shutter speed or a slow shutter speed, you can see that the shutter on the far left is uh, closing and opening much, much slower than the one on the far right. Um, and again, to reiterate, um, with a slow shutter speed, what you get is um, more light, um, less ability to capture of motion. Um, in a fast shutter speed, you're going to be able to stop motion as tracks. It's really great for sports photography or any kind of high motion photography. But also the trade off is that you don't get as much light into the lens. So, again, you have to compensate for that. Another aspect of shutter speed, uh, another way to think about it is um, in duration. And so the longer the duration, the longer the shutter stays open, again, as we've talked about before, the more light comes in, the shorter duration, the less light comes in. Um, you can see in this photo, as time increases, um, the ability for the photographer to capture or for the camera, in this case, to capture motion is uh, decreased. Another factor in controlling the exposure of images or manually controlling the, the exposure of images is ISO. And I've kind of mentioned that a few times earlier in the lecture. It stands for International Standards Organization. And what ISO refers to is the amount of uh, sensitivity the sensor has in the camera. Every digital camera has a sensor within it and it is light sensitive. And so the way that the numbers work with ISO, you'll see ISO and then a specific number, um, which can range from 100 all the way to, in some cameras, 32,000 or, or more. Um, the lower the number, the less noise or grain you'll get in your image, but also the less light sensitive the sensor is. And the opposite is true when you go to the higher end, um, the larger the number, the more light sensitive the, um, the, uh, the sensor is, but also the higher the noise or grain that you get in your image. And so uh, a rule of thumb for most photographers is to try to shoot with a low ISO and uh, change the other aspects of the exposure triangle. Um, it is good to have a camera that can go to a higher ISO if you need it, but most times, um, again, you're going to get this noise or grain in the image that some photographers find uh, uh, not very desirable for their for, for, the, for their photos. And so the choice is yours, depending on what your ultimate output uh, is or what you want your image to look like ultimately. Um, but for the most part, most photographers, at least in, in, in my own photography, I try to make sure that the ISO uh, is at a rate where I don't have a lot of grain. If you have a DSLR, um, nine times out of 10, you'll see a exposure light meter or exposure compensation meter. And basically what that does is it'll give you a light reading of the room that you're in or the area that you're in. And uh, it will uh, show you uh, this, this little gauge right here. You can see it under um, correct exposure, underexposure, and overexposure to, to the direct right of those. Do you have this um, uh, this line here? Negative two, one, zero, one, and plus two. And what it does is, again, whenever you take a light meaning reading, uh, it will show you the little dot underneath the zero there, this little dash, uh, and that's basically showing you how much light you have in the room. And so if it's right dead in the in the center, um, your exposure should be um, exactly correct. Um, so you should have a nice, even exposure in terms of the light. Um, if it's going over to the left, like you see in the underexposure section um, where the dot is over or under rather the one, you will uh, underexpose your image, meaning that you won't have enough available light to make a proper exposure. Uh, Below that, overexposure, if it's going all over to the right, um, you will have too much light and your image will be uh, too bright. Um, 
Now, that being said, all of that being said, it all depends on the amount of available light. Um, you might need more light to expose your image properly. You may want to overexpose your image. You may want to underexpose your image. It all depends. It all depends on the outcome of the photo. Um, but again, this is here uh, to make sure that you can gauge the light um, that you're in. You also can uh, use this on your smartphone. There are some uh, applications that you can download that will give you more manual settings on your phone or the camera on your phone. And so you can change uh, uh, or you can adjust for exposure. You can adjust ISO. Uh, you can adjust shutter speed. It gives you uh, a much more manual experience. Now let's talk about manual controls on smartphones. I mentioned earlier that uh, you can download applications that will give you um, the ability to manually control uh, the phone, the camera on your phone. So let's look at a few of those. One application that uh, I've found useful uh, in terms of controlling uh, the camera on your smartphone manually is the Moment Camera app. Um, they make lenses for smartphones, external lenses, but they also have an application that you can use to, again, more manually control the camera on your phone. And so you can adjust for um, exposure compensation, ISO, um, uh, shutter speed, all the things that you can do on a DSLR, you can do uh, in the moment app. So um, this is one of many applications you could download. I believe you can download it in the app store for, I believe it's uh, six dollars, um, which uh, to some students might seem like, oh, that's lunch. But um, um, it's well worth the cost. Um, you, know, you get so much more uh, control in the camera or in the phone, rather, in this case, um, when you have applications like that. So um, consider uh, downloading uh, Moment. But there's also, again, many other applications that are free. Um, you just have to kind of explore the the the, uh, the app store. Maybe even um, I've, I've Googled um, best camera apps for 2020 uh, before, and usually they'll give you a list of all the top ones. And um, usually two or three out of, say, ten are free and quite capable. So do your own research, but um, Moment is um, a decent application for the iPhone. Also, for Android, you have Camera FV5, um, which is uh, a very capable, um, very flesh, well fleshed out application for Android phones. Um, once again, just like Moment, um, you can adjust for uh, Exposure via the exposure compensation scale. Um, you can adjust aperture. Um, you can adjust ISO. Um, you can um, work with white balancing, which we haven't talked about, um, but we will in uh, future classes. Um, once again, this just makes your camera or the camera on your phone uh, much more powerful, much more professional and uh, much more manual. So you can do much more with these cameras. In the next lecture, we will be discussing composition, um, which is how you frame your subject within the frame, um, whether that's a person or a landscape. Um, there's all there's always some type of methodology in terms of how you place the, the subject in the frame. So we'll be talking about that next. Um, however, in the meantime, what I'd like for you to do is to take the things that you've learned uh, from this lecture and start practicing. Um, pick up your phone, uh, pick up your DSLR, whatever camera you're using and become more um, um, accustomed to using it manually. Um, don't let this lecture uh, be your only resource. You can you know, read up on uh, uh, other sources in terms of uh, learning more manual aspects to your camera and just start shooting. Start shooting, um, get the cobwebs out, start practicing now so that when we get into our assignments, um, you'll be much more uh, in depth to using your phone. You won't have many roadblocks, hopefully. And so uh, practice and shoot as much as you can.
Um, lectures from now on will be in this format. Um, please keep your eyes open on Moodle. Make sure that you are checking the class um, schedule to see when lectures will um, be posted. But for the most part, I'm going to post them exactly when class starts um, uh, at the beginning of class period. So again, please stay tuned, stay plugged in. Um, if you have any questions, um, make sure that you're emailing me, get in touch with me, and I will answer your questions as soon as possible. Until next time, I'll see you later.